Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our Moving People Forward session on redefining safety in Colorado's transportation system. We have some interpreters joining us for today's session, so I'm going to start by handing it off to one of the interpreters for instructions on how that's going to work. And hopefully we do actually have interpreters. Mo or Jack, can you correct me if I'm wrong about that? Jill, I do think, I, I don't think we have interpreters for this session. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, so we do not need to worry about the instructions for interpretation and translation. Again, thank you everybody for joining this session on redefining in Colorado's transportation system. I'm Jill Locantore, the Executive Director of the Denver Streets Partnership, and I will be moderating your session today. We're going to get started with a few housekeeping items. All of you as attendees have your video and audio set to off, but we do encourage you to participate actively throughout the session by submitting comments and questions through the chat function. If you like, you could go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat right now. Um, and you can also submit questions directly to the panelists via the Q&A function. We will try to get to as many of your questions as possible, either in writing or during the panel discussion. We would like to start off our session today with a land acknowledgement. At Moving People Forward, we must not only talk about the future, but also acknowledge the past. Our team would like to reserve space to recognize and honor the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations who were the original occupants and custodians of this land for centuries before genocide and ethnic cleansing led by white settlers. We're grateful to these communities, their living descendants in Colorado and descendants of those forcefully relocated here for their wisdom and resilience in both the past and the present. It's critical that we keep in mind the connections between transportation and these American Indian communities. Everyone in this meeting today travels and recreates on stolen land. Many of us choose how we get around and the impact that we have on this land. Many of us also make decisions on transportation systems and how land is used that further influence our community's footprint. And while our fields often discuss freedom of mobility, we must also acknowledge the right for people to stay in places that were taken from American Indians by colonizers. Thank you for honoring these people and their land with us. I would also like to thank our sponsors who made the Moving People Forward Conference possible. Our presenting sponsor is Lyft. And our champion sponsors are Quality Bicycle Products, People for Bikes, and Colorado Bike Law. And specifically for this session, our sponsor is Boulder County. Finally, I would like to remind you all of the norms for our Moving People Forward Conference. We ask that you as participants be present and actively listen generously share your thoughts, ideas, and questions via the chat or the Q&A, assume best intentions of our panelists and each other, challenge your own assumptions, and seek to understand new, different, or constructive perspectives, expect and accept non-closure, especially when we're talking about difficult topics like we will be tonight, lean into that discomfort, and let's hold ourselves and each other accountable to these norms. People is arguably the most important words in our conference title, Moving People Forward. And so for each session, we have produced a video highlighting a personal story that relates to the theme of the session to underscore how the ideas that we are discussing impact people's daily lives. For our session today on redef redefining safety, we'd like to share with you the story of Denise, a former RTD bus operator and a regular RTD writer. My name is Denise Bowler and I live in Denver, Colorado. 
I usually get around my city by public transportation, uh, ride share occasionally, and taxi cab occasionally. The particular way that I get around that I think is the most safest is probably the ride share. For one, you get to identify who the driver is and the car. As a black woman, when I'm traveling, it actually depends on the input that comes from other people. Uh, I have traveled on, you know, just walking, not riding anything, where I have been stopped by police for no apparent reason other than them making a assumption and they were totally wrong. We use the, the term sundown town. And what that means is if you're African-American, I, I can't speak about other minorities, but if you're African-American, in certain areas, you don't be out after dark. So when the sun goes down, Basically, you know, when the sun goes down, you get out of town or you go in the house. You don't be out and about. In the presence of law enforcement, honestly, I am nervous because you never know what type of attitude they're bringing to the situation to start with. So now it's not as severe as a female per se, but I have boys or men, and I'm really nervous in that situation. Well, my younger son, and this was years ago because he was in middle school, and something had happened, and a police officer, he, you know, it's a group of fellows, and maybe two or three, he's a small circle person, and the police kind of ran up on him and jumped out of the car and, show me your ID, where are you going, blah, blah, blah. So when he came home and explained the situation to me. I was outraged, honestly. I called Denver Police Office, uh, Police Department, and I said, first of all, don't you ever approach my child without identifying yourself as law enforcement and showing a badge or a business card. I have instructed my child not to stop for anyone that does not have proper credentials because children have been kidnapped and all other sorts of things. And they were, well, no, there's no need. Yes, there is a need. I'm an African-American woman with African-American boys and you guys know what the situation is. Uh, one of the ways that we can kind of curb the bias, sensitivity training is a great part of it. Um, the, but the other, the other part of that approach is, I mean, you can do all the sensitivity training and anti-bias training and anti-racist training that you want. It will bring a level of awareness but it will not necessarily stop that because these kind of things come from the way you were raised and the way, you know, and the things that influenced you. And so it's hard, you can change, you can put this out there, but you can't change a person's sentiment. You can't change their minds. You, you, you can't change their ideas. It, it, I think a lot of it has to do with the way people are raised, and I call it, you know, what they discuss when they're at the dinner table. So we are very excited today to welcome four panelists and we are gonna have each of them introduce themselves shortly. If I can have the panelists go ahead and join me by turning their videos on and I will introduce each of you briefly. We have with us tonight, Senator Julie Gonzalez representing Colorado's 34th district, Director Chantel Lewis representing the Regional Transportation District B, RTD District B, Marisa Jones, who is the Policy and Partnerships Director with the National Safe Routes Par Partnership. And finally, Jack Todd, Bicycle Colorado's Director of Communications and Policy. Before we get to them, we want to learn a little bit more about you all who are in the audience. Since we can't be together today in person, 
Uh, we're going to use one of Zoom features to do a quick poll to learn a little bit more about you. So Mo, can you pull up the poll for us? These questions are totally anonymous um, and they're all optional. You, don't, you can only answer the ones that you're comfortable with, but we hope that you go ahead and answer several of them so we can get a feel for who's in the audience today. Just gonna take a, a few minutes to let people answer the poll. Hopefully some of you got to attend the keynote session this morning, a very inspiring presentation by Dr. Destiny Thomas really helped set the stage about a lot of the equity issues that are the theme throughout our Moving People Conference, Moving People Forward Conference this week and next. It looks like we've got a pretty good percentage of people responding. If Mo, you want to go ahead and show the results to the audience. So fantastic. 88% of you got to see the, the dynamite presentation this morning at the keynote. We've got a, a pretty good mix of participants. Excited to see 51% of you identify as an advocate, um, as well as 41% of you say that you're currently a Bicycle Colorado member. Not too surprisingly, we have majority white audience, but good to see some other demographics in the mix. Um, pretty sobering statistic here that 51% of you has been involved in a traffic crash or someone you love, uh, just bringing home how relevant our topic about safety is today. Um, and an even bigger, or sorry, a smaller percentage of you have been a victim of personal violence. So before we get into the meat of our panel, we wanted to introduce a couple of terms that you're going to be hearing during the discussion today. When we use the word traffic violence or traffic safety, we're referring to crashes, injuries, or deaths that happen as a result of the design of our streets and interactions between people who are traveling along that street, regardless of whether they're walking or biking, driving, trying to access transit. And regardless of whether it's an intentional or not, you know, a, most of the crashes that happen on our streets aren't because somebody's intentionally trying to hurt somebody, um, but unfortunately the violence still happens in that context. And when we talk about personal violence or safety, we're referring specifically to harassment or physical targeting of someone specifically because of their personal identity. Historically, transportation professional and professionals and advocates, including Bicycle Colorado, have often defined safety in our efforts, specifically focused on safety from traffic violence, um, whereas we've failed to acknowledge how biases, profiling, and discriminatory policies against particular identities have also threatened people's safety and mobility. So we're really looking forward to tonight's discussion to help all of us better understand these perspectives and keep them top of mind as we are working to influence and make transportation decisions. So we are now going to let each panelist take a few minutes to introduce themselves, their work, and any personal or professional experiences related to safety that they would like to share with our audience as we discuss redefining safety. Hey everybody, um, my name is Senator Julie Gonzalez and I am honored to represent North, West and Downtown Denver um, at the Colorado State Senate. Um, if you hear my little pandemic puppy uh, uh, panda barking, um, you know, Zoom life. Um, but, um, you know, I um, uh, just want to, um, I want to start off by saying, um, that um, uh, 
I really appreciate the fact that this conversation is happening um, because I've been honored to partner alongside and, and work alongside um, Bicycle Colorado um, on at, as they've uh, presented policy um, at the Capitol um, for, for our consideration. Um, but my work uh, that brought me to the Capitol is really, um, was really um, rooted in um, how to make systems that oftentimes don't work um, for marginalized communities, um, how to actually start to make those systems better serve um, all Coloradans, regardless um, uh, of, their, of their race, of their national origin, of their age, um, of their income, uh, and what have you. And a lot of my work prior to my service in the cap at the Capitol was rooted in, in um, working alongside um, undocumented people, um, young people, um, uh, um, low-income people, um, to ensure uh, that they had uh, access to systems that would serve them. And um, I, I do wanna name, um, and I think on the next slide, um, you can see um, that that's a pretty difficult task. Um, and a lot of times um, uh, systems haven't served uh, all communities equally. Um, and, um, and, you know, whereas we can have one conversation around um, transportation, um, we're actually oftentimes dealing with legacies of um, interlocking systems um, that have compounded upon one another um, over, um, uh, over generations, quite frankly, um, uh, and multiple systems um, that, have, um, sought, that have actually worked to create haves and have nots. Um, and so um, I just wanted to, I like love to geek out on maps. Um, and if you all are, um, uh, familiar with this idea of the inverted L in Denver, right? Um, that um, uh, the this inverted L um, in some ways has nothing to do with transportation and in some ways has a lot to do with transportation. Um, and it's fascinating to me to see how um, this inverted L, right? This I, um, it's really rooted in um, uh, Denver's history of redlining, um, of determining who had access to what land, what access, um, uh, who had access to property, um, and um, and the benefits that come with that. How those um, policy decisions from generations ago continue to have ripple effects and reverberations on all sorts of. Um, of uh, policy problems that confront us today. Um, you can just see, um, uh, so that middle map is the, 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 the history of, of redlining in, in, uh, in Denver. And um, you'll see that on the map on, uh, the purple map uh, to your left, um, you'll see a lot of that same inverted L um, around the north bands and the west bands of the city. Um, that continue to reflect um, higher rates of COVID. Um, uh, the lighter colors are, are higher um, or lower rates of COVID infection and uh, the darker rates are um, uh, higher rates of vaccination, right? And I'm really honored um, to represent Northwest and downtown Denver. And in this, in a funny way, uh, my map also um, represents that inverted L, right? And so as we start to think about um, my community and my community that has a lot of haves and have nots, um, uh, those questions of um, access to transportation, those questions of access to safety um, really become important. And, um, and so if we, um, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, you can see um, that we have a couple of, of challenges as policymakers, um, how do we make systems um, function and work, uh, and, and in some cases build for the first time, and in other cases rebuild um, trust that has been broken, right? 
Um, and, and we do that um, is by first acknowledging um, the fact that there have been longstanding systemic injustices um, that we need to tackle um, and to quite frankly be bold enough to challenge um, and tackle um, by, by enacting uh, transformative policy, right? Um, it's hard because quite frankly, we oftentimes, um, it means that we, it's slower. It means that the work is harder. It means that we have to be more intentional and being more nuanced and being, be willing to listen and to learn to one another. Um, but quite frankly, um, a lot of marginalized communities uh, are impacted by um, unsafe systems in a number of ways, whether that is a violent immigration system, um, air pollution, noise pollution, uh, police violence, um, gun violence, um, uh, a raging pandemic, right? Like multiple systems um, are, are impacting our community safety. And um, so I think our challenge and our opportunity in this moment is um, thinking about how we, how we move forward, um, uh, taking all of those systems into account, um, understanding our history, understanding um, our legacy and understanding how we move forward together. Um, and to me, um, to have this conversation about transportation um, is really powerful because transportation is, um, is, is, is an opportunity of like how we actually um, move, um, how we um, traverse space um, and how we um, can do so in ways that either separate people or how we actually bring folks together. And so there's a, there's a tremendous um, opportunity there and I look forward to um, having uh, this conversation um, in the Q&A. Thank you, Senator Gonzalez. Next, we're gonna hear from Director Lewis. Thank you, um, and thank you, Senator Gonzalez. It's always nice to hear from you. Um, and I really appreciate the maps as well. Uh, if you could go back to the first picture because it's kind of an important one. Um, I, I um, wanted to take a moment to just kind of talk about myself and the reason that I decided to, um, to run for the RTD board, but I snapped this picture um, on the 15L. It's my favorite ride. Um, it's the one that gets me to and from work. And it's a family, it's, it was a, a young woman and she had um, six kids with her. And that probably stuck with me because I am um, one of six children with my mother and we used to catch the bus quite often. And you can't really see, but the students are, the young children are all sleeping um, in this photo and it was kind of late at night. Um, and, and I am all, I'm often reminding myself to keep um, these folks, these writers um, at the front for, forefront of all the decisions that I make as an RTD elected. Um, I grew up on public transportation and public transportation has always been such an important part of my life. Um, and um, really ensuring that as I am advocating, as I am thinking about policy, as I'm making decisions, um, that I am centering the lives of those that are most marginalized um, and most vulnerable in our communities. And so I wanted to start with this picture because I, um, I think it gives a, a good backdrop um, to who I am and why I chose to serve on the RTD board. You can go to the next slide. Um, so some facts and figures. You all know this, but I think it's important um, in terms of uh, in terms of our backdrop um, as we're having this conversation. Um, so we're, we often are talking about what you know what is it that RTD is supposed to do, and and our mission statement is to meet our constituents' present and future public uh, transit needs by offering safe, clean, reliable, courteous, accessible, and cost-effective service. Depending on who you as we might meet one or two of those or all of those. Um, it just kind of depends on the experience for the individual. Uh, but I thought I'd start with um, really recognizing that we serve a lot of people. Um, the service area population is 3.8 million um, folks. Uh, we span across 40 municipalities um, in eight jurisdictions, two of those being city and counties. Um, and our service, our square mm -hmm. miles um, in service areas, 2,342. I mean, I just and and I, I just think it's important that we um, really ground this conversation in how large uh, the district is, but also how diverse the needs are within this just dist, um, within the regional transportation district, but also within um, our districts as elected officials. You can go on to the next slide. 
Um, so talking about transportation um, and security, safety and security. So I just wanted to give you all an understanding of um, how uh, transit security has really morphed um, and changed um, in term, in, within RTD. Um, and so I just put this map in here, just our map, this timeline, excuse me, uh, Senator Gonzalez has me saying maps. Um, I put this timeline in here for you all, um, just so you can understand of kind of what um, led us to this point. And I intentionally um, stopped at 2012 um, with our allied um, security contract because it's been one that I have been incredibly interested in since I um, became, um, since I was, well, prior to being elected, but um, most certainly um, as I was elected on the RTD board. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. Uh, so let me give you a breakdown of our transit, our current transit security model, because it is an interesting one. Um, so we have RTD transit police officers. These folks are post certified. Uh, we have about 21 in the agency. Um, the second um, security folks that we have within RTD. Uh, so these are actual police officers, just so you know. Um, the second employment officers are also police officers from different counties. Um, so we have Thornton, Lakewood, Denver, and Aurora, uh, where we um, have inter, um, IGA's intergovernmental ag agreements with these folks, um, and they provide um, um, security for us as well. Uh, these are armed um, security officers. And we also have um, our allied universal security officers, which actually comprises the most, um, the, the, the largest um, number of our security personnel, as you can see. I, I, just put this number 300, this might be different today um, than it was, uh, but it's an important number for you all to know. Um, and then this is actually pretty recent, but I stuck it in here because I think it's important for you all to know, um, is our allied universal transit, transit safety ambassadors. And this was a move to move, this was our hope to move away from criminalizing um, poverty, essentially. So having folks um, who are armed security guards, taking check-in tickets um, with a, a, a gun on their waist, um, which can be pretty intimidating for some folks. Um, and then I added in here this homeless outreach coordinator, and you'll understand why when I get to the next slide. Um, and I just wanted to give you all some context. So if you can go on. Uh, so we've been having a lot of discussions at RTD about um, safety and security. And I think one of the first ones, uh, one of the things that became very apparent to me and maybe other directors as well is we ha didn't have shared understanding and shared definitions of what safety meant for some communities, what security meant for some communities. And I would even say as much so um, as our operators and our patrons um, that we hadn't created this shared definition. And so we had gone into um, these conversations around our code of conduct. And so we had got a, uh, a small group of folks together um, to review our code of conduct. And as we were looking through this code of conduct and we were doing so in partnership with community, some of the language felt a bit loaded. Um, some of the, the language felt coded um, that we were actually targeting a specific demographic of folks without actually naming who those people were um, within that language. Um, and so we had a lot of good discussion about, um, you know, and I gave this example here, RTD, RTD may in its sole discretion regulate the movement of individuals to enable the provision of transit services. Um, pretty vague, right? Quite ambiguous. Um, and so depending on who might, who might be responsible for ensuring that this is happening um, could have different outcomes. And I think we've seen that on our transit systems. Um, and so I had this bright idea, I have to chuckle. And it, you see it says failed, pri failed because it was one of the first um, um, actions that I had put forward as an RTD director. And, and what I was proposing is that instead of us um, having a, um, a security model that was really based in bad behavior that we were that we were instead looking for solutions that might be alternative to how we were defining safety in the context of RTD. Um, and so, you know, not criminalizing, not criminalizing folks who are having who are having a hard time, right? Who might not be able to pay the fare, who might be having a mental health um, crisis, who might be experiencing homelessness. And so I put this forward. There are 15 of us on the board of directors. Uh, you, you need three other, or two other directors uh, to be able to get something on the agenda. And uh, the two folks agreed to put this on the agenda. Uh, we got to the board meeting and I was the only person to, to vote to support this measure. Um, it was quite devastating for me. It was actually a pretty hard night. 
Um, but it did give me the opportunity to, to take a step back and think about, you know, what might be a more um, effective approach um, to, to encouraging uh, my fellow directors, my colleagues to reimagine what safety and security might look like because we were hearing from our, our operators that they did not feel safe, uh, that many of them did not feel safe in their roles. But while we were also hearing at the, at the same time in, in, in certain communities that they were being over-policed um, in, in their communities. Um, and so we put together the Safety and Security Ad Hoc Committee. And this ad hoc committee was really designed, and I'll go into the next slide where this is, uh, we put together the Safety and Security Ad Hoc Committee. Um, we also, I also brought in someone to give a presentation to the board because I thought maybe, uh, the, well, the, I understood that the messenger was important, but to have more voices come to the table. So it wasn't just me saying, hey, this is an important issue for communities, but having communities come directly to the board. And so we had the opportunity um, to have uh, someone come to our board meeting and give us a presentation, um, which yielded uh, after many conversations internally and, and at the board level, uh, us trying a pilot on uh, the inline, which was recently opened, where we, uh, instead of having armed security guards who were checking fares, we now have a pilot where we have 18 arms, unarmed security guards um, that are checking fares. You can go on to the next slide. So within the safety and security ad hoc group, I think what had come up quite a bit is we, we still hadn't determined what our shared definitions of safety and security have been. And so while we had just while we had agreed that we wanted to be sure that we are addressing the needs of all of our customers, that we wanted to minimize agency exposure and liability, mm -hmm. I don't think we agreed to what those things meant um, co cohesively as a collective board. Um, and if you go on to the next slide, um, we I put quite not quite there yet. We'd have these meetings where we get a document like this, where it says crime and a percentage of change, but there was no context. And so um, the board was really having conversations without the baseline data to be able to inform these conversations or this committee, um, this ad hoc committee, excuse me, not the board. Um, and, and, it, and it felt like, okay, maybe we should take a pause. Um, maybe we're not going in the direction that we need to go in um, because we don't have the data um, to be able to help us um, to inform to inform our next steps. And so if you go on to the next slide, I can tell you that today, <laughs> um, what's next in terms of security and how we're looking at security, um, safety and security, I mean, hopefully reimagining um, safety and security at some point is to do a peer review with APTA. Um, and so uh, I'm actually quite excited about this because it gives us an opportunity to take a step back, to have folks who are in transit agencies, to look at our transit data, to look at um, our background uh, information, um, to have conversations with staff, to really be able to understand what it is that we might need um, in terms of safety and security um, within the agency, um, and to work in partnership with the security consultant um, to really uh, want to assess our needs, but also to provide some recommendations and how we might be able to move forward. Um, as well as delivering really extensive outreach and engagement because that was absolutely missing from the conversation as we were um, grappling with this as board directors um, and, 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 and moving towards building and implementing a community-based security model. Um, and so while the night when I was the single uh, director who voted to support um, reprioritizing our dollars um, in terms of safety and security, I do feel quite hopeful um, that we are moving in a direction um, that will be positive um, and will be beneficial for all of our communities um, within this large diverse district. Thank you. Thank you, Director Lewis. Next up, we have Marisa Jones. Thanks so much for having me. Um, as Jill mentioned, my name is Marisa Jones. I'm the Director of Policy and Partnerships at the Safe Route Partnership. I don't live in Colorado, I live in Philadelphia. Um, you can go on to the next slide. So about our organization, we are um, a national nonprofit that works to advance safe walking and rolling to and from schools in everyday life. And we really do this work because we know that supporting people to get around safely um, is, is, is the, the foundation of healthy, thriving communities. And all of our work is done with an intentional eye of 
um, improving the health and well-being of people of all races, ethnicities, abilities, and disabilities, income levels. Um, move on to the next slide. So um, one of the things that I think is really important as came up um, in the intro and what Director Lewis just was just mentioning, different definitions of safety. So I want to share our organization's definition of safety, especially since it's in our name, the Safe Routes Partnership. So what do we mean by safety? We mean that people are not injured or killed as a result of traffic violence. We also mean that people are not bullied or harassed. And we mean that people are not victims to physical violence, threats, or intimidation. And something I think is just so important for us to acknowledge up front is that safety is not monolithic. What when one person's perception of safety is not necessarily another person's perception of safety. And one person can't speak for an entire community. And so I just think that's important to acknowledge up front. And I think, um, as Senator Gonzalez said, like that means sometimes it gets a little messy and we have to slow things down when it's not this like clear cut definition, but just think that's really important. Then I also wanna acknowledge that our definition of safety means that we wanna prevent all of those things. But at the end of the day, what we really want is we want people to not just be killed, not just be harassed, not just be hurt. We want people to arrive at school, at work, at a park, ready to learn, ready to work, ready to connect with their, their neighbors and friends, being joyful and like being able to fully move throughout the world in their full presence of self. Move on to the next slide. So I'll just give a quick framing of where our organization stands on safety. Um, and I'll also share that I'll drop a link to a longer presentation on this if anyone's interested. So the first thing I wanna share is just like how important it is to acknowledge that we created the conditions that compel people to make quote unquote unsafe or even criminal behavior. And you know, there are entire doctoral dissertations on this, but our land use planning and zoning and the way that we build our cities or, or don't, where, how we make decisions about policy and funding and who gets crosswalks and sidewalks and bike lanes um, have both intentionally un and unintentionally promoted segregation and discrimination by race and income. And there are some little infographics here that show like high income communities are much more likely to have sidewalks than low income communities. Um, thing on to the next slide. So we create these conditions and then we criminalize behavior that doesn't, that we kind of set people up for. So we don't create safe places to walk and then we call crossing the street without a crosswalk jaywalking and that is a crime. And we see um, in communities all across the country that traffic enforcement targets Black, Indigenous, people of color, and working families. They disproportionately bear the burden of traffic violations. Moving on to the next slide. Um, and so we really believe that making sure that people feel safe from traffic, from crime, and from violence, but that the current tools that we're employing aren't working. So the same way that I said, like safety is not monolithic, our solutions for making people feel safe should also not be monolithic. And yet our number one tool tends to be police law enforcement. Police law enforcement for uh, making up for our inadequacies in our transportation system. Police law enforcement for making up for inadequacies in mental health services and lack of living wage. And when push comes to shove, the the increased use of police law enforcement for making people feel safe doesn't actually achieve that goal. For a lot of people, increased police presence actually um, elevates concerns about personal safety. Move on to the next slide. And so what should we do instead? And so three things that I would offer. So the first one is that we need to invest in neighborhoods that have been underinvested in and that that runs the gamut. But in this specific conversation we can talk about investing, prioritizing infrastructure investments for people to be able to walk, bike, wheel, get to transit, get around their communities safely. We have underinvested um, in black, brown, indigenous, low-income communities. We need to put in the infrastructure that supports people to get around. Second of all, we need to decriminalize mobility. We, we set up the systems of what is a crime 
is jaywalking a crime or is that a function of government or decision makers? We didn't put, we didn't, we haven't given the supportive infrastructure. So decriminalizing mobility. And then the third thing is um, supporting community led and defined safety initiatives. And I have a little picture of this publication that we have uh, that we put out probably seven or eight years ago at this point, that's all about what are community based um, public safety initiatives, everything from safe passages programs to holla back training for anti-street harassment. So there are lots of different tools that we can employ um, to support this robust and diverse perception of safety for people moving throughout their communities. Thanks. Thank you, Marisa. And finally, we will hear from Jack Todd from Bicycle Colorado. Hi everyone, I'm excited to be here tonight. It's nice to see some, some familiar names on the line and some unfamiliar names. So um, for those of you who I don't know, um, I'm Jack Todd, I'm Director of Communications and Policy with Bicycle Colorado um, and recent Bicycle Colorado historian, I guess, when preparing for this session a little bit. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of Bicycle Colorado and, and kind of the history of why, how and why our definitions of safety have changed as an organization um, and evolved, I think, into, into something um, better. So Bicycle School Colorado, um, a lot of people don't know this, we were actually founded as a tourism magazine. Um, so we were, we were founded to bring people to Colorado to come ride their bikes and explore all the great things that, that Colorado has to offer. Um, and a couple of years after our founding, we merged with um, the Colorado Bicycle Coalition and the Colorado Bicycle Industry Coalition um, to start focusing more on, on advocacy. Um, these are actual news clips from, from our office binders um, that, that I was able to dig up um, about some of the advocacy work we did in an early on. And um, early on, we were, we were headquartered in, in Salida, Colorado, um, on the way to the mountains. Um, and it was only in 2002 that we moved to Denver's Union Station uh, in a tiny office well before uh, De Denver Union Station was, was renovated to, to what we know today. Um, Mo, if you could change to the next slide. Um, and so in the 2010s, we, we began focusing more heavily on transportation bicycling issues while, while uh, maintaining a focus on recreation. Um, and in 2018, we published our, actually our first ever strategic plan uh, with, a, with our, again, first ever commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And at the beginning of that process, you know, the strategic plan was published in 20, November, but um, we started that process in, in February or March. Um, and it was really toward the beginning of that process that we started having internal DEI discussions as a staff. Um, and, you know, I think um, we were surprised that, you know, some of us weren't on the same page or, um, you know, frankly, our lack of awareness about conversations of, of DEI outside of our space. And we were, we were kind of living in our, our little bike bubble in a way. Um, Mo, if you can go to the next slide. Um, and we've, we've really continued those discussions since that time, um, to, to then, um, uh, sorry, I have some puppies, a puppy running around that, that distracted me for a second, um, to get to where we are today. And so in June of, of 2020, like so many organizations, we were, um, we issued a statement uh, due to the George Floyd protests and, and the, the uprising that we were seeing. And, you know, one thing that, that I thought about at that time was, you know, if this was a couple of years ago, we might not have issued a statement because we might not have felt it was authentic. Um, but, but the authenticity with which we were able to publish something and kind of show our support for this movement and, and really advocate for, for bike advocacy being more of a social justice issue um, than, than we've ever frankly talked about um, was a result of, of these ongoing internal conversations that we've had. So um, I wanted to just talk very briefly about that and, and say that, you know, our definition of safety, while it was originally, you know, for, for tourists, for people coming to Colorado for organized events, um, and for, frankly, bicyclists who look a lot like me, 
um, in, in most scenarios. Um, that's really changed and, and we really want to work to, to be a more inclusive organization and, and to serve and represent everyone who rides a bike who doesn't look like me. Um, and, and that's really been a, a driving force in our work and, and something I'm very proud of. And so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you to all of our panelists for those great introductions and really thoughtful approach to defining what safety means to you and within the work that you do. And we're gonna transition now to some questions we have prepared for the panelists and discussion, um, as well as questions from the audience. So please do continue to share your questions and your comments through the chat and the Q&A. Uh, but I'd like to start off by asking each of you, you know, you've talked a lot about how you have defined safety, how that may have evolved over time. Um, but can you give some specific examples of policies that you are now advocating for based on that understanding? And, and what, if any, pushback are you getting for these new policies that you're calling for? Um, maybe we could start with Jack answering that question. Yeah, I might I might flip it a little bit and answer a policy that we're not um, that we're advocating against at this point, actually. Um, and Senator Gonzalez, I'd be I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. But um, you know, for several years now, we have advocated to to add one specific crime to Colorado law, and that is uh, distracted driving. And we know that there's a huge problem with distracted driving. We we badly, badly want to solve it and find the solution to it. Um, but we realized that that we can't advocate for adding a crime any longer after seeing time and again, police violence um, and violence inflicted upon people of color. And, and so we, we moved away from that. We moved away from it when we issued that statement in June, 2020. And, you know, something that we talked about internally was, you know, today in February, um, as the legislative session is going, we wanted to be as frustrated by um, violence inflicted upon people of color as we were in June. And, and we've held true to that. And again, that's something I'm really proud of. Um, but Senator Gonzalez, you, you voted on, on hands-free bills in the past because, I mean, we, we advocated for you to do so. And so I'd be curious to get your take on that. I know Jill's asking the questions here, but um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting connection in this panel for sure. No, um, thank you so much, uh, Jack, for, for um, the, the handoff. <laughs> um, because, you know, it is, um, uh, you know, one of, I learned a word over the summer um, that has really stuck with me and that word um, with simultaneity, right? This idea that multiple things can be true um, and it doesn't make one set, one, the other person wrong, right? How can we lift up um, the value of um, uh, traffic safety while also um, recognizing that um, uh, adding crimes to the books may actually have um, a disproportionate impact on um, uh, people of color. And so um, that was, it was a hard, um, uh, Panda, she only barks when I start talking. So <laughs> um, it, that was a hard um, uh, uh, space to navigate because at the end of the day, you have to vote, I have to vote yes or no. I can't say like, no, can we like keep talking about it? Right, like at the end of the day, given Colorado's single subject rules, um, you can only um, consider one policy at a time. And um, oftentimes our policy frameworks don't allow for that um, simultaneity, don't allow for that, um, uh, breadth and, and, and depth and nuance, right? And, um, and so it ends up being a pretty narrow um, 
a policy conversation of, do you support adding this, um, uh, this additional um, crime to our statutes or not, right? And so I actually, I think it's um, a testament, right? To the, um, to the way that we're all being challenged um, and that we're all um, trying to, to um, reckon with um, these imperfect systems, right? That, um, uh, that Bicycle Colorado uh, has taken this new um, stance and position. Um, I see y'all, that's dope. Um, and then also, um, how can we continue um, at the legislature at all levels of government, quite frankly, um, this conversation around um, creating safety for everyone, recognizing that some folks feel safe with um, uh, having more police officers some, and some folks uh, feel less safe. Um, some people feel um, uh, most safe in their cars. Some people feel incredibly um, uh, unsafe um, with as many cars on the roads as we currently have. And so, right, like um, lots, lots of conversations to come and our work as legislators is to sit and, and, as, and as advocates and, um, and, uh, and enthusiasts, right? And, and, um, uh, and all of the identities that we carry, right? Is to sit in that complexity, um, listen to each other, learn from one another, understand that it's gonna take time. When we come together um, and when we actually do hear each other, um, that's where we actually get to solutions that can work for all. Marisa, maybe you could speak to how you're grappling with that complexity with the, the national partnership and, and what are some new policies that might have emerged from your thinking on these issues? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to answer that. So um, at the Save Rights Partnership, as I mentioned, we've had this like robust definition of safety for a long time. We have really done some um, deep work on pulling together active transportation and racial and social justice um, and really talked about the field of active transportation for like almost 10 years now. Like this isn't new to us. Um, and yet we have still, as part of the six E's framework of safe routes to school, which some of you may be familiar with, we still had enforcement as one of those foundational six E's that we were putting out there. It's like, this is really essential to all safe routes to school programs. And I will just put this caveat here that for right now, I'm talking specifically about safe routes to school. Um, and over the years, especially through our work with civil rights organizations and through our active transportation equity work group, we were pushed to set, to drop enforcement. Like this is not making people or communities feel safer. Um, and for a long time, we tried to figure out ways to do equitable enforcement. I could, we have countless memos on doing, doing enforcement more equitably. And um, I think like many groups, even though social justice and racial equity are not new to us, George Floyd's murder was a, a real reckoning moment for our organization. I was like, you know what? We, have, we haven't been listening. We've been having the conversations and we've been trying to make this a little easier for our field. Like we, you can do this in a, in a equitable way. And ultimately we came to the, the decision that enforcement is actually not foundational to safe routes to school. And we, maybe just haven't really been listening to people in our fields and in our network that police involvement in getting kids to and from school is not necessary for safety. And so we decided to remove enforcement from the six E's of safe routes to school. And we decided to add in engagement and really recognizing that as I think my fellow panelists have been saying, like we have to listen to people. We have to listen to other people's experiences and trust them and, and validate them and listen to them as true, even if they don't resonate with our own lived experiences. Um, so that's one of the big things that our organization has done in the past couple of years. That, you know, and Jack, I really appreciate you talking about Bicycle Colorado's like historical arc. And, and this is, we haven't reached a destination. We're just continuing to be on this journey, but 
really listening to our field and being pushed um, and, and yeah, trusting people's experiences to be true and valid is really what got us to this point. So that was a, a pretty big announcement when the Safe Routes Partnership said they were going to drop enforcement from their, their ease, you know, as you mentioned, that had been part of the toolkit for years. Did you get pushback from some of your partners or community members who didn't quite understand why you were going in that direction? Yeah, and I will say that actually overwhelmingly people were supportive. I think a lot of people were like, hey, we've been telling you this for years and we will readily admit that. We will say like, yeah, we were told this and we weren't listening. Um, so most people were supportive, but we definitely had people who were not. And we had, I'd say like the main kind of negative feedback we got was like, it's not all police officers, like this police officer is good. And so we've had to have a lot of conversations about the difference between people and systems and a, one person's actions are different than the way a system is created to benefit some people and disadvantage other people. And, and it's hard, I think, a lot of the people that we work with, you know, a lot of this work is both personal and professional. Um, and people are just at different points in their journey. So that was one piece that is like this, how do I break up with my police officer who's been involved in in our safe routes to school program, they are they are a really good person. So that's been one thing. And then a second thing is like, we've got a lot of pushback that it's like, we made this bold assertion and haven't um, given people enough tools for like, how do we do this? And I think that's on us to recognize that like, right, we're talking about safe routes to school. We're not like, that's our, not even our jurisdiction, but that's what we were talking about removing enforcement from. And we can't pretend that disentangling police law enforcement from getting kids to and from school is going to solve the larger issues at play here. And so I think that we've compelled some of our, some people in our network and our field to wade into issues that feel really insurmountable. So that's, those are kind of the two big pieces of pushback that we got, but overwhelmingly we've been really heartened by the response. It's like, okay, like we get it. And like we want to do the work and just people are at different points in their journey um, and we've actually had some really great conversations with law enforcement police law enforcement who have been involved in safe route to school over the years to talk through like what have their experience has been and what did they think of this announcement and yeah just making sure that we're separating like individual experiences from the the system of of policing as we know it So a number of you have brought up the issue of, of crime as it relates to safety and the idea that maybe we need to redefine what counts as a crime, but also crime being an issue that, that members of the public might raise when they're talking about what makes them feel safe or not when using the transportation system. Um, and I'm curious to hear particularly from you, Director Lewis, you know, how you think about this in the context of transit you know, if when people are waiting at bus stops or at train stations, some of them might be citing crime as a reason that they're uncomfortable using transit, but there might be reasons other people feel like their behavior as a transit rider is being criminalized. Can you talk about how you're thinking about that as in your role as RTD director? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. I'm happy to. Um, I think one of the, th one thing that's really important for me and my leadership um, and how I approach this work is to recognize that communities are not a monolith, right? And oftentimes when we are talking about safety and security, um, it's, from, it's from a very cookie cutter approach and we're applying the same definitions, the same approaches to different communities that have different needs. I mean, we have yet sometimes to have conversations um, to be able to assess what those needs are. And if we're really not doing a great job, we fail to even bring those communities into the conversations. Um, at the beginning before we start to even plan, implement, discuss um, any of the things that we might do. I have a responsibility as a director and, and, I'm, <laughs> and I'm not perfect. I, I, I continue to make these mistakes and learn more and more. Um, I have a responsibility to my constituents, but I also have a responsibility to our frontline employees. And what's in, what 
might be safety and security for our frontline employees may not, may be over policing, right? Or feelings of being unsafe to for communities. And so there's a balance. Um, and so it's, I think there are a few things that I think about, and I don't think of safety in just in terms of like armed security guards or like being behind walls or um, having weapons to protect us. I think about housing security, right? I think about um, being this food security, right? Things of that nature. And those are a lot of the folks who we are carrying, uh, carrying on our services. Um, I would say the two big things that are coming up for me is how do we really move away from decriminalizing poverty, right? When we're talking about fair checks um, and someone is given a ticket because they didn't have $3 for the, um, for the fare, it's probably unlikely that they have the 50 or the 80 or the $100 um, for that ticket. And so it really changing the conversation, right? Um, and, and, and figuring out where the resources are within the agency that already exists. We have one for that example. And when we talk about folks who might not have the fare, instead of giving them tickets, we could actually just send them over to the folks who do our live program to see if they qualify for discounted passes. Sometimes it's that simple. Um, but if we aren't thinking, if we're, if we're approaching this from this cookie cutter approach, I think we sometimes get um, um, solutions that don't really work for a lot of people and maybe work for a small amount. I, I saw in the chat and then I'll, start, I'll stop chatting. Um, I saw in the chat that there's a director, maybe a former director, um, who advocated um, for having police on the 15L. And I think this conversation is important because I've heard, I, I catch the 15L, but I, I've heard from patrons that they would like to have security on our buses, but you find security most often on our trains. I mean, if you look at the two demographics who typically ride trains and who ride buses, those demographics are quite different. Um, and so I, I do think it's important that we are really grounding ourselves in those communities and having conversations. And I do to the best of my ability, really trying to get those, those diverse voices, even if I disagree with them because they provide me with something in terms of how I lead and how I make decisions um, so that those aren't harmful decisions to one community while benefiting another. So if we're, if we're moving away from law enforcement as the way to enhance safety, whether it's safety from crime or safety from traffic violence, what, should, what is the alternative? What should we be doing instead of using law enforcement? And I'll open that to whoever wants to answer that first. I'm happy to go in. Oh, go ahead, Senator Gonzalez. Oh. Um, I mean, we you go ahead and start and then I'll follow up after you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, that's a, that, I love that question. Uh, I think because we've only known law enforcement as it is, we rarely have the opportunity to think about what could be, uh, what, what could be in terms of difference. And so I, I would say, I don't know what the alternative is, but I've heard a lot of things that people say that they would like instead of, and I actually have not heard folks, um, well, yes, I have. <laughs> the conversations that I've had at the local level um, as it pertains to transit security and specifically, uh, it's not always about defunding the police and getting completely rid of the police. It's, it's prioritizing our budgets differently so that, we, so that our response matches whatever interaction or crisis is happening in that moment to the individual that we're having a conversation with. That is most important. Uh, we've talked about homeless coordinate, homeless coordinators, homeless outreach folks. We've talked about clinical caseworkers, clinical staff. Um, you know, those are some of the needs. I don't know the answers, but I, but I do know that if we went out into the communities that were impacted by safety and security, who had definitions of safety and security, and we asked them to define what those are, we could most certainly figure out what alternative methods to safety look like in all of our communities. And they may look different depending on where you are. So um, in my work at the, at the state legislature, um, I have had the opportunity to hear from um, uh, people who have been survivors of crime, um, as well as um, people who have been um, who have committed crimes, right? And who are um, uh, either um, formerly incarcerated or currently incarcerated. Um, and um, I've been really 
um, struck by uh, the power of um, restorative justice um, in terms of actually naming um, from uh, a process that is um, led by um, the victim, by the person who has experienced the harm. Um, to then say, um, this, is, this is the impact that that harm has caused me, and then creating um, uh, an opportunity for um, the person who caused that harm to say, to hear that, to say, oh, okay, this is how we could approach things differently, or this was what my intent was, or I'd never understood um, uh, the consequence of my action. Um, and it actually um, creates healing. Um, and I think actually um, creates space for, um, for, for change. And um, we've seen restorative justice practices work incredibly, um, in very powerful ways um, uh, in a number of um, uh, contexts with youth um, as they're learning how to manage uh, conflict and emotion. Um, and um, we've also seen it um, work um, uh, for people in the, within the criminal justice system, right? And, um, and so that to me, uh, sort of building off of uh, Director Lewis's um, comments and perspectives around, um, you know, for a long time, uh, how does that phrase go? When you're a, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Um, when, when, um, when there was a problem for many, many years, um, it was politically popular for um, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to say, great, we're gonna toughen our laws, we're gonna put a new crime on the books, we're going to put more cops on the streets and we're gonna, you know, and that was the response. And it's not the only, it's not the best. Um, and sometimes it's it's not the, the correct um, solution to a policy problem that, that, that may exist. And so, um, uh, you know, from, from a, um, from just a practical matter, I feel like there's so many opportunities um, for us to think differently. Um, and the last thing I'll say is this, um, uh, totally different context, totally different um, uh, issue. Um, but one of the things that I have um, uh, worked on for many, many years is um, this idea of discretion um, uh, from prosecutors, right? Um, whether that is in the in the criminal justice reform context or within the immigration context, right? Um, we actually saw um, in the immigration context um, under uh, the Obama years, um, we saw a um, a sharp increase in uh, deportations and a um, uh, a shift away from. Uh, prosecutorial discretion, where a prosecutor would actually say, I've got 10 cases, I only have the resources to prosecute three of them, which are the cases I'm going to um, uh, resolve in other manners, right? Um, and, um, and instead, under the Obama years, we saw immigration uh, deportations skyrocket for people being labeled as criminals for things like driving without a license. Um, and, um, and we actually had a, a, a conversation um, uh, that ended up um, here at the state capitol. This was before I was a, a, a lawmaker. I was an advocate, just like all of y'all, um, uh, on the other side of this <laughs> dynamic, um, saying, you know what? Like, if we actually allow undocumented people to um, have access to driver's licenses, it will make our roads more safe, right? And it, it was a shift away from criminalizing and, a, and an opportunity to, um, uh, to let people have access to um, uh, the licenses, the education, um, the road safety courses, all of that, that ended up having um, two benefits. One, um, 
undocumented people were able to get driver's license, meaning that they were they had to learn the rules of the roads, and we um, then had um, you know fewer um, uh, accidents and what have you, and um, and also um, uh, less criminalization of immigrant communities, right? And so that was a win-win situation. Um, totally tangential policies that found a way to come together. And I think as we um, sit with these complexities, um, it, it really is exciting to think about all of the different ways in which um, uh, advocates um, for, for, for safety in different contexts can come together. And Jill, if I can just hop on quickly from the transportation side of things, you know, um, I, I think we're thinking about transportation the wrong way if we're if we're thinking about it being so crime focused. <laughs> um, so what I would prefer, and Jill, I know what you would prefer, and um, I know that some of the advocates on the line will think this is maybe a little too pie in the sky, but like we need to design systems and we need funding for systems, transportation systems that discourage behaviors that put people at risk. And so if we can eliminate the crime altogether, like that, that's what we should be striving for because there's not a single victim of traffic violence or a family member of someone who has lost to traffic violence who would prefer where they are today to having their loved ones with them. Um, and so, you know, striving for asking for more from our transportation system in terms of how we keep people safe is what we what we need to do. Thank you, Jack. And I do want to give time to answer some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. And this first one is for you, Jack. Um, can you elaborate on how some people in Bicycle Colorado were stuck in what you call the bicycle bubble and how you were able to move beyond that bubble? Yeah, I should clarify. Um, Bicycle Colorado, our staff um, were all very much on the same page um, with with getting out of that bubble. So it, it wasn't a, a staff issue. And um, but I think, you know, bike advocates historically, again, they, they look like me or <laughs> like me um, from my age to my age 40 years from now. Um, and so there there's kind of a um, Marisa used the term monolith earlier. There's there's like one general thinking a lot of the time. Um, and so getting people to, to kind of change their perspective and, and practice some some empathy and, and at times kind of radical empathy um, to, to put themselves in someone else's shoes. A, a lot of the time, I think these, these safety changes and, and these hard conversations just come down to empathy. And at Bicycle Colorado, we're fortunate to have a very empathetic staff and um, leadership and, and a, a supportive board who, who want to to be that voice in this conversation. So we have another question from the audience, you know, knowing that communities throughout Colorado are really very different. If you're talking about the Denver metro area or some places that are more rural or outer parts of the state and that diversity is very different in, in these different communities, the demographic makeup. Um, so are there policies that need to be passed at the local level that would be different from one community to the next or at the state level that would be appropriate across all that different diverse types of communities we have across the state? Um, maybe Senator Gonzalez, you might have some thoughts on that. Um, sorry, my, I'm going to be honest, my little puppy, um, <laughs> being a, a puppy, um, can, can you just repeat the last part of that question? Sorry. Sure. I, like, what policies do we need to be passing either at the local or state level that respect the different demographics of the, the communities across the state and some are more diverse than others? Um, thank you. The, um, I, I think that, um, we're, we do our best work um, policy-wise when we build um, policies that benefit everyone, right? That instead of pitting winners versus losers, um, 
against one another. Um, and it's really easy to do, particularly in this moment, um, to say, oh, this is Republicans versus Democrats, or this is car riders versus um, bicyclists. This is, you know, um, uh, people of color versus white folks. This is haves versus have nots. The more that we can um, uh, listen and, and sort of um, advance policies where there's win, 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 um, the better off that we are. For my, um, uh, from my perspective, um, as someone um, who, you know, um, has been a longtime activist on immigrant rights, but who also is a sixth generation Chicana, like my family has been here in this country since before, like Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico were the United States, like, and quite frankly, since before they were Mexico, right? Like, um, understanding that um, there are um, certain privileges that I carry um, uh, and certain certain times when I need to step back, right? Um, and then other times where I, I am able to um, use and, and leverage my, uh, my privilege as, you know, as um, a senator, as someone who is um, uh, bilingual, as someone who navigates systems for a living, right? As someone who has um, middle class privilege, right? Like naming all of those things um, and being willing to um, to learn um, from people who are differently situated. I think that's how we end up with um, stronger policy. I I think that at the um, at the state level, um, one of the things that I'm absolutely fascinated with. Um, because it's such, it it um it impacts so many other areas of policy is um, super wonky and boring, and it's tax policy. Um, and um, Tabor, um, if you're not familiar with it, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights um, uh, was passed by um, uh, the Colorado voters and added to our constitution back in 1992. I was in like second grade. And um, and it has fundamentally changed um, what is possible in terms of our budgets, um, in terms of how we fund education, how we fund transportation, how we fund healthcare, and all of our other priorities. And um, and I think that there um, will be a conversation actually around um, transportation funding at the Capitol this upcoming legislative session. Um, and we're gonna have to have some really deep and intentional conversations around, um, uh, around how we pay for the things that we value, right? And um, yeah, it's gonna be a thick conversation. <laughs> it's gonna be intense. And, um, and I fear that if we um, try to um, uh, create winners and losers, so we'll all be less off. But if we actually do the work of um, uh, ensuring that this, um, that our transportation um, funding policies um, advance equity um, uh, and, and center the people who are transportation dependent, um, then we all um, will benefit as a state. And so, um, as we prepare to return to the Capitol, it's going to be a fun time, y'all. Um, and uh, I look forward to engaging with each and every one of you on that policy conversation. We have another question in the uh, Q&A from the audience about the 20 is plenty campaign that we have in Denver and cities across the country are calling for lower speed limits, knowing that higher speeds are more likely to result in serious crashes and fatalities and injuries. But the question is, does lowering the speed limit give police more opportunities to, to target people? Um, I wonder, Marisa, if you could speak to how you're thinking about that from the, the national partnership perspective, especially since speed limits is a huge issue around schools. That's where we have the lowest speed limits set typically in a community. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is being a little kid and 
we had this like window unit air conditioner that my mom was really afraid would fall on our heads. And so she told us not to play under it, but we played under it anyway. And so then she put a cactus there. We didn't play under it anymore. I think 20 is plenty. And I, you know, I'm not from Colorado. I'm not familiar with that. I think education campaigns are great. They're not that they don't cost that much, but they also don't compel people to slow down. And by investing in infrastructure and engineering solutions that slow cars down, um, I think we can be more effective at actually slowing the speed limit and not creating a condition for rely like police law enforcement costs less and can be implemented more quickly than installing speed humps. But what's really the longer term, more effective solution? installing traffic calming devices that slow things, slow things down. I believe in the symbiotic relationship between um, education and engineering solutions, but I think for the longer term and the less, the less dependence on police law enforcement, um, an engineering solution is, is the long-term way to go. Jack, do you have anything to add to that? I saw you were typing answers in the chat when I raised that question. I was just going to add, you know, th there is behavior change that comes from from education campaigns. Maurice is right. Like we need more permanent, more effective long term solutions. Um, but I, I think that question sort of assumes that everybody will keep going at the same speed um, once the speed limit is reduced and the research that there's research that I'm aware of that indicates that there is behavior change that comes from that. So um, th there's, uh, it's kind of a, a neutral change that has neutral crime change, I should say, that has has safety benefits. And I think that's something that we should we should be considering as well. Yeah, I would agree that uh, the data has been really interesting from cities like Seattle or Boston, where they very deliberately did not increase enforcement when they changed their speed limits, and yet they saw that the, uh, the average speed that drivers went decreased just by changing the speed limit, and especially drivers who went egregiously fast over the speed limit. Uh, decreased even more dramatically. But to Marisa's point, I think the primary value of changing the speed limit is it creates the justification for making those changes in the street design that we are now, our design standards are to reinforce speeds of just 20 miles an hour rather than designing streets for a higher default speed limit. Marisa, did you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I wanted to just, since you brought up Seattle, I wanted to just add something that we, like I mentioned earlier in the call, like, oh, we've been thinking for a long time, but like, how do we do equitable enforcement? And one thing that Seattle does is that um, traffic fines that occur in school zones. So if you speed in a school zone, that money goes to a safe route to school fund that works on like site specific improvements. And Hawaii has a similar um, surcharge. And so we do see some opportunity for, as I mentioned earlier in my intro, like we've designed the streets this way that are less safe in certain communities. And so I know just completely taking the punitive element out of traffic safety is, is a conversation that's happening, but we do see some promise for site specific reinvestment of funds. So it's like, we know that these engineering solutions cost a lot, cost a lot of money. And if we can, if part, if an intermediate strategy is ticketing and, and finding, then that money should go back to making that place safer. And that's happening in up some places. And, and this is a great example too, I think of how data can be helpful in understanding these issues around safety, like knowing what is the impact of just changing the speed limit without doing any additional enforcement. Um, and Chantal, you had raised the issue of, of of data in your introductory presentation and how you felt like you didn't have good data to make informed decisions as an RTD board member. Can you speak a little bit more about what data you would like to see to help you make more informed decisions? Yeah, um, so I, I think all kinds of data. Uh, I, there are some data that did exist, um, but when we were really starting to dig in um, around like the number of um, violent incidents that uh, 
incidences that might occur. Um, the uh, number of folks who are uh, get, utilizing our services and don't have fares, um, the number of arrests that might be happening, um, the number of um, interactions with our transit security officers that might um, happen. I, I think what we were really looking for was just a myriad of baseline data and to put it all into one place. Um, I think we have the transit security app, right, which collects data. Uh, we have our transit security officers who coll collect data. What I did learn is that we don't have a specific individual who um, is responsible for tracking our, I'm gonna use crime because this is the term that was used internally, um, our crime um, data and, and to do that analysis. And so that's really what I was looking for as an opportunity for us to say, okay, this is what the data is telling us. And then we might be able to jump, um, be able to do something with that from there. We are running out of time, but I want to ask one final question for each of the panelists. We'd like to close by providing our audience with some ideas on action items that they can take to uh, apply the lessons that we've been talking about during this session. Um, so maybe if we could do a quick round robin and each of you could answer, what can our audience do to support the safe mobility of all people regardless of their identity? And who would like to go first? I can start that one. Um, I, I think you got to start with yourself. Um, and and again, I mentioned empathy earlier. Just practice stepping outside your your own perspective. Um, that I think is the most important starting point that that you can you can. This is the most important place you can start from. Keep doing things like this, engage, listen, learn, um, challenge um, your um, your own perspectives, your own assumptions, um, and consider different ideas from people who um, you don't always agree with. Marisa or Chantel? Yeah, I, I would just say, and I say this all the time, I always feel like a broken record. Um, is to really center uh, those that are in the margins, right? Those that are most oppressed, those are most vulnerable. Um, center them in their experiences and, and everything that you do, no matter what it is. Because um, I, I do think it's really important. We sometimes forget about the folks um, who are struggling, who are having a harder time. Uh, someone mentioned um, our communities with disabilities, right? Um, think about those communities that are most oppressed in your decision-making. Um, even if it's hard to do that, even if it's uncomfortable, and if you make a mistake, um, keep doing it. And Marisa, you wanna leave us with a final thought? Sure, echoing the sentiment that a lot of my fellow panelists said, really engaging with people who aren't like you, who may have a different lived experience, um, and doing so with an open mind and with curiosity, um, trying to understand and recognize that people have different lived experiences. And that's part of what gives our life so much richness and robustness. This isn't something to be like modified for like, oh, we have to control for these different things. Like this is what makes, this is what gives us like creative solutions and yeah, it brings our life so much richness. So approaching it with curiosity um, and as I mentioned earlier, like trusting and validating people's experiences, also not like, the one person you talk to is not representative of a whole community. And yeah, I think it's kind of a change in perspective of how we approach our work. Um, and yeah, it's exciting. And yeah. Thank you so much to all of our panelists tonight for sharing their fantastic insights with us. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, but we do have a quick announcement for the audience that we wanted to share in the next slide, Mo. Uh, we have a few resources there. I don't know, Mo, if you wanted to put those in the chat, uh, but the, the exciting news is if you're looking for a new bike, uh, we have two opportunities for you to take one home this month, potentially. Uh, you can win an Atlas Carbon Road Bike donated by our friends at Alchemy Bicycles or an electric County 7D donated by the good folks at Campus Cycles. 
we have a raffle running through March 1, and you can get your tickets at the, the web address there. So hope you take advantage of that. And thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And we hope to see you back at our next session at Moving People Forward, which is Thursday morning at 9 a.m. That session will be focused on shaping inclusive cities through land use, housing, and transportation policy. And thank you again for everybody joining us tonight at this session and have a good night.